All right. Well, amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 7. 2 Corinthians and chapter number 7. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, I I use uh, social media uh, uh, not as, as radically as what some people do. Uh, I've often felt like perhaps if... Uh, uh, some folks in the White House could get the president in a headlock and take away his cell phone so he couldn't use Twitter. Uh, it, we might have a few, a li- little bit fewer controversies sometimes going on. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I understand sometimes people's frustration with that, but I do use social media. Uh, I have a Twitter account. I have a Facebook account. And uh, I try to use it basically as tools to uh, stay in contact with folks uh, in Inform and in uh, and, and a lot of cases amuse. Uh, a lot of times I post things just because I think they're funny. Uh, and uh, uh, you may not always appreciate my humor, but sometimes, you know, I try to throw out something that I think is just humorous. And, of course, I want to inspire you, get you to look to Jesus, and that's the key thing. But you know one thing I've noticed sometimes is uh, social media is, uh, and, and it's always been this way, but I, it grieves me when I see one thing uh, taking place is that it's being used as a, uh, a format, a platform to attack other people. Now, uh, I understand. Now, I realize you've got to stand for what's right. Amen? Okay, I don't ever believe in, in compromising on right and wrong. If something is right, it's always right. If something is wrong, it's always wrong. And sometimes we just got to be willing to take a stand and, and call out what's right and what's wrong. But a lot of times we spend too much time attacking other people that also claim the name of Christ. And, uh, and I really wonder sometimes what lost people that don't know Christ as Savior think whenever they see some of these uh, posts that are just designed to attack uh, back and forth uh, other folks. Uh, you say, well, now, preacher, that we're, we're in rents. We don't have that kind of a problem. No, we may not use Twitter, but sometimes we use uh, telephones. Sometimes we use just conversations. Uh, sometimes you might even u- want to use the ugly word uh, gossip <laughs> and put that in there. Uh, you know... I think sometimes instead of looking around and and seeing, oh, I see a problem over there with that person, and I see a problem over there with that person, and, 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 you know, oh, look at that. Mm, Anybody can see that that's not the right thing. Before we start doing that kind of stuff, maybe we ought to be looking within ourselves first. Now, what a radical thought. (laughs) But look within ourselves first. And, uh, and so let me share with you today, I, I, I believe, uh, uh, a truth that will help us if we'll allow the Lord to work in our hearts and lives. And uh, so, uh, so let's stand together. We're going to begin reading with verse number 1. We're going to read through verse number 11, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it was uh, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. 
For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your precious word. And I pray now, Lord, that you would just have your way and will, Lord, in our hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that every one of us would just be willing to lay our hearts before you this morning and ask you to take the uh, that heavenly spotlight of the Holy Spirit. Show us, Lord, the areas in which we need to, uh, Father, just commit to you and, uh, and, and just be right in your sight. And, oh, God, just be with us and, and show us our need. And, Lord, most of all, if there's someone here that's never truly said yes to Jesus, show them, Lord, that they need Jesus today more than they need anything else. And so, Lord, just God bless and direct, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, it's amazing. It's easy to see everybody else's flaws. But if somebody else points ours out, isn't it amazing that we've always got a good excuse on why ours isn't really that bad? Have you ever noticed that? I mean, I think we're all prone to do that. Uh, and, and I can speak from personal experience. But the, I believe this. I believe if we're ever really going to be all that God wants us to be, then we really need to take action so that we can be within what He desires us to be. And so, you know, th this is a good time for us to say, all right, uh, here I am. Lord, I want you to speak to my heart. I want you to show me my area of need. I want the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate that area of need. And then I want to commit it uh, to your care, your guidance, your direction, so that I can be all that God wants me to be. And so, let, let me just share this with you. Now, to be honest, uh, the majority of my sermon, and y'all pray that uh, it works out this way, is actually going to be on the final point. So that means the first two points, just buckle up, we're going to go through them pretty quickly. Amen? Because uh, I, I really see most of where where the Lord just impressed my heart in the latter portion of this text. But look at verses 1 and 2 again. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, notice the I-N-G ending there, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, Receive us, we have wronged no man. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. We have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. You see, Paul was the one that God used to establish the church in Corinth. And after he established the church, he moved on and was ministering in other areas. And Corinth went through some real big time difficulties. I mean, they were abusing spiritual gifts. They were off base on a lot of uh, basic things. And then on top of that, there was uh, immorality in the church that was really pretty terrible. And yet they did not want to address it at all. Apparently it was someone that was rather prominent in the church. And so because of that, it was like, oh, well, you know, just, just let it go. Just let it go. And so Paul wrote a letter to him, and he was really pretty harsh in 1 Corinthians. And he says, you know, you need to turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? He got on their case about their abuse of spiritual gifts. He said, you know, you guys are just making a mess out of this thing. And so uh, when they first received the letter, apparently uh, they didn't appreciate it very much. But then God began to work in the church... And by the time Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, there had been a real moving of the Spirit of God in their midst. And they really had gotten a lot of those issues resolved and they were going in the right direction, which was a wonderful thing. Paul said, listen, I, I didn't want to hurt you. I didn't want to corrupt you. I wasn't trying to defraud you. He says, but listen, you know, you, you need to continue to work in this direction to, to cleanse yourself. Remember those promises that God has given us and cleanse ourselves and perfect holiness. First thing that I want us to see is this, our sanctification. That word sanctification means our 
growing more and more Christ-like, our sanctification is an ongoing process. Okay? You just don't flip a switch and all of a sudden we're sanctified. Okay? We are to be sanctified, but it is perfecting. It is an ongoing process. You know, Jesus illustrated this truth whenever He uh, had the disciples together right before He was getting ready to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, right before He would be captured and carried to the cross of Calvary. He got the disciples together. They had their last meal together. And then the Bible tells us in the, in John chapter 13 that He put a towel about Himself and began to go around and wash the disciples' feet. And when he got to Peter, I want you to notice what happened. John chapter 13 verse number 8 says, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Uh, Jesus said, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you've got nothing to do with me. Peter said, well, let's don't just stop with the feet, man. Give me a total bath. Uh, no doubt about it, I want to be with you. And then Jesus says something that's very profound and often overlooked in this next verse. It says, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now that not all was talking about Judas that would betray Jesus. But Jesus was basically saying, No, you don't need a total bath. You're already clean because you believe in me. But as we live this life, as we walk through this, this life, guess what? We pick up some of the dirt of the world. And Jesus says, you need to wash your feet. You need to get rid of the things that are defiling you. You need to confess those sins that, that creep into our lives on a daily basis. You need to wash your feet. On a regular basis. That sanctifying process is us cleansing ourselves. Jesus was illustrating that to them. And you know what? L listen, uh, I've been saved a long time. I trusted Christ as Savior uh, almost 57 years ago. Okay? Uh, that's a long time to walk with Jesus. And yet the fact of the matter is, I realize more today than I did even back then, I haven't made it yet where I know I need to be. That's why the Bible says, familiar passage, Philippians 3.13, Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He says, No, I haven't apprehended. I haven't arrived. I'm not, I haven't made it to where I need to be, but I'm continuing to press on in that direction. Now, the big issue for us is, are we growing closer to Christ's likeness on a daily basis. You know, that, that's a good way to gauge the success of our Christian life. Am I more like Jesus today than I was last week? Am I more like Jesus today than I was last year? Am I more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? You say, well, now, preacher, you know, you, you don't want to go crazy on this thing. Well, I want to remind you, Jesus died on the cross for you so that you could have an eternal home in heaven. Don't you think He at least deserves for us to be dedicated and live for Him? I mean, are we growing in Christ-likeness? So, uh, so sanctification, ongoing process. Next thing, verse number 3 he reminded them of the fact that uh, of why he wrote 1 Corinthians. He says, I spoke this not to condemn you. For I have said before that ye are in our hearts uh, uh, to die and to live with you. And great is my boldness of speech towards you. And verse number 8, he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive for the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but, but, were but for a season. You know, he gave them a stern message. But here's something that we need to remember. A stern message can be an act of love. You know, you, you just can't always sugarcoat helpful 
information. Uh, you know, you go to the doctor, and the doctor looks at you and says, you need to lose weight. And you say, well, I don't like that. I want a second opinion. He says, well, you need plastic surgery, too. Uh, <laughs> I started to say you're ugly, too, but I decided I'd use more tact. Okay? But the idea is... We don't always like what the doctor... I, I still remember a few months ago when I went to see my cardiologist and, and he told me some of the worst news I could have ever gotten. He said, you know, you ought to cut back on caffeine a little bit. Now, you don't understand. Caffeine has been my friend for many, many years. <laughs> I mean, I can remember a time I drink at least two to three pots a day. I mean, listen, you take away my caffeine, I'm not even sure I'm alive. And lo and behold, I said, I don't lie. But then I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So now my quota is a cup and a half a day of regular coffee. To this day, I still don't like it. I still want to drink a half a gallon for breakfast. To this day, I like the smell of coffee. I like the taste of coffee. But the doctor said, don't do it. You know what? It was a stern message, but I know it was for my benefit. Uh-huh. Listen, just because we hear something we don't like doesn't mean it's not good. You know, we warn those around us, and you know why we do that? It's because for somebody, we are their watchmen. Uh, you know, Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17, I'm not going to read the entire passage, but he says, Son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. He says, hey, I've made you a watchman. Guess what? Our job, if we are believers and followers of Jesus, we are here to be watchmen for somebody. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had vacation Bible school. Guess what? The reason we do vacation Bible school is not just because we want to spend hours and hours and hours decorating the facilities and doing a bunch of goofy stuff and, and, and feeding folks out in the Family Life Center. And, uh, and we just don't have anything else to do with our time. So let's just go ahead and do VBS for a solid week. That's not the reason we do it. You know why we do it? Because for some of these boys and girls, it's the only option opportunity that they're ever going to have to have somebody tell them that Jesus loves them and Jesus will save them if they put their faith and trust in Him. We're the watchman for somebody. You're the watchman for somebody. Somebody will listen to you better than they will listen to anybody else. We need to be the watchman. You know, and we warn to help, not hurt. You know, I <laughs> I, 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 the, the older I get, the more I'm beginning to understand this. None of us are called to be spiritual bullies. But we are called to help people. Warn people. You know, I, I thought about this last night. Many years ago, my son Matt, just a little guy, couldn't have been more than about maybe seven or eight. We went out and we were running a trot line on a lake in Florida. Now, y'all know what a trot line uh, is? I figure here in Georgia a lot of you would. Okay? We were trying to catch catfish and turtles. I used to love to get soft shell turtles. And Boy, you talk about good eating. That is good eating. Okay? And, uh, and so... We had gone out and run the trot line, and we had uh, we had some catfish, and I'd put them on a stringer and had them there by the boat. We were uh, it was right back behind one of our church members' house, and, and we were parked out in their driveway. And then every couple hours, we'd go out and get in the boat and go out and check the trot line. And so we'd been sleeping in the car, and about two a.m., I said, "All right, boy, come on, we're going to go check the line." Okay. So we got in the boat. I, I had a, a light on, on my, on my, you know, spotlight there on my forehead. And, and all of a sudden I said, all right, grab the stringer and throw it in the boat. And as he reached down and grabbed the stringer and began to pull it up, something caught the corner of my eye. And I hollered, drop it! Oh, drop it! 
Drop it! Hanging on one of those catfish was a water moccasin. He was about ready to bring that stringer inside the boat with us and drop it down. And there was a water moccasin trying to eat one of my catfish. I finally decided to throw that catfish away. Uh, but uh, it, it was hanging on. And, and then I took a, a paddle and started trying to beat uh, the, the water moccasin in the water while he was swimming off. Now, you know what? I don't think my son appreciated me yelling at him at 2 o'clock in the morning. The neighbors around probably didn't appreciate it either. But that was a stern warning because I saw imminent danger. Does that make sense? That wasn't hatred. That was an act of love. Hey, danger! Get rid of that thing! And boy, once he saw it, he, he got all shook up. He said, I don't want to go out there in that water. I said, no, buddy, we're going out in the water. I mean, they're, they're just out there. We just got to deal with it. Okay. And we ran ahead and ran the trot line for the rest of the night. Wow. Stern messages sometimes are meant to help, not hurt. And we warn, not for our benefit, but we warn for the benefit of others. You know, fact of the matter is, we're not here to gain a, a, a following. Uh, let me share this. And boy, I'm running short on time, so y'all be uh, pa patient with me here. I'm going to get there as soon as we can. But I had a guy many years ago come. Uh, when I first went to uh, the church that I pastored in Florida, uh, let's put it this way. When Sandy and I got married, the night we got married, I weighed 152 pounds. And uh, let's just put it this way, I weigh more than that today. Okay? So I was 152 pounds. Now, I'd gained a few pounds by the time I started passing that church, but not that many. Now, over a period of time, I got up at one point to right at 260 pounds. Now, thank the Lord I'm not there anymore. Okay? But at 260, I looked like I was 13 months pregnant. And, uh, you know, and, and this guy came to the church one time and he says, Hey, I, I'm trying to find a guy that, that used to pastor this church a long time ago. I mean, he, he really helped me. I can't remember his name, but maybe you can help me track him down. I said, Well, how long ago was it? And he, I said, Well, that was me. He said, No, 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 no. The guy that I'm looking for was a much smaller guy. I said, Yeah, that was me. He said, Man, what happened? I said, Good eating. <laughs> Now, the bottom line is, here's the neat thing. He didn't even remember what my name was. And you know what? That's okay with me. But he did remember that I'd help point him toward Jesus. Hey, our job is not to gain a following. Our job is just to point people to Jesus. Point people, I mean, exalt Christ. What did John the Baptist say? He said, John chapter 3, verse 30, He must increase, but I must decrease. Then let's jump into this last portion here real quickly. Sometimes we just need to have a, a search within because it's needed and overdue. Verse 9, he says, Now rejoice, not that, I, uh, that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. We'll save that last verse for just a moment. A search within is needed and overdue. You know, sometimes I hate to say this, but uh, uh, our run gets detoured. I, I wish Cindy Savant was here I would love to see the expression on her face when I give this illustration. When I first came to uh, Rince Baptist Church, I used to get out and uh, uh, I called it jogging every day. I'd get out there, buddy, and I'd take off and I'd head down. I lived in the Pastorium. I'd head down to Coleman Register Road, then out to 117, then down to Snow Hill Church Road and head up Snow Hill Church Road. I'd go by the Skipper's house and up to the top of the hill, then turn around and come back. And that was a three-mile route. Well, one time it was the middle of the summertime. It was about 105 degrees. It was the middle of the day, and I'm out there doing my thing. Of course, got sweat just pouring off of me. Cindy Savannah's pulling along with her kids, and she says to her kids, Who in the world is that fool out and running in the middle of the day? Then she found out that fool is the preacher. 
you know, I don't jog anymore. Variety of reasons. One is the knees wore out. I don't jog anymore. My run got detoured. If I'm not careful, I'll let exercise get detoured. You know, sometimes our run, our Christian life called a run can get detoured. In the book of Galatians in chapter number 5, uh, there, there's. Uh, let me just read one verse out of this, but it, it, it says a number of things in this passage. But it says this, verse number 7, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Then it says in verse 9, The little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know, uh, has our run been detoured somewhere along the line? Have we become disobedient to truth? You know, uh, our problem sometimes is not that we don't know what the truth is. Many times our problem is we know what the truth is, but we've already made up our mind we want to do something else. I've said this many times, but it breaks my heart every time I hear it when someone is talking to me and they'll say, well now preacher, I just want you to know, I know what the Bible says, but this is what I'm going to do. And it always befuddles me. I said, well, if you know what the Bible says, then it's not even an issue anymore. Just do what the Bible says. Have we allowed leaven or sin to go unchecked? Well, that's a real problem. Do we realize even that judgment awaits? You know, either in this life or when we stand before Jesus. The truth of the matter is, guess what? Whatever we do is going to have consequences. You say, well, I've done things and there have been no consequences. Not yet. But even if we don't see it in this life, we'll have to answer for it at, at Jesus' feet. Make sure that we realize that. That's very important. And then, will we really face our need for repentance? Sometimes we just got to stop, uh, you know, trying to justify our wrong actions. Proverbs 21, 2 says this, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. You know, I can always make excuses. You know, I, I remember one time I was heading home. I picked up Jennifer from school this quite a few years ago, and I was going up, uh, 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 440, going down 441, just crossing over the Turkey Creek Bridge, and I saw a deputy coming from the other direction, and I saw the front end of his car go down. Now, you know what that means? That means he's hitting his brakes. And I looked down at my speedometer, and I was doing 75. That's a 55-mile zone right there. His lights come on, and I just pulled off. I didn't even worry about waiting for him to get behind me. He said, you have any idea why I called you, uh, why I stopped you? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> no excuses. Just wasn't paying attention. Do whatever you got to do. Now, by the grace of God, he only gave me a warning. <laughs> Hallelujah. But the bottom line is this. Sometimes we say, well, you know, my, my speedometer's not working right. And you know, I, I, I think you were trying to entrap me. And I, listen, you start on that kind of a line and I guarantee you, you're going to get a ticket. Sometimes we just need to quit making excuses and just face reality. Okay? And, and that's important. And we need to take actions that make things right with others. You know, the Bible says there in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has ought against you. That doesn't say that you have ought against your brother. No, you remember that he has ought against you. It says leave your gift and go make things right with him. Sometimes we just need to forgive freely whether anybody else ever wants to get right with us or not. Mark chapter 11 and verse number 25, the Bible says this, And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. You know, sometimes we just got to let it go. Let it go. That's too heavy of a burden to carry all the time. Just let it go. But you don't know what they did to me. Well, God knows all about it. Forgive them. Move on. Move on. Leave it behind. And then we need to just look at, will our repentance be genuine? Verse 11. 
goes on and it begins to say that they sorrowed after a godly sort. And then the Apostle Paul writes a variety of different things here. Let me just real quickly show you a little bit of a broader expansion of what these terms mean. He says, yea, what clearing, uh, yea, yea, what carefulness it wrought in you. Carefulness has the idea of diligent speed. You say, well, careful? How does that fit into that? Well, it's the idea of saying, listen, I want to get the maximum speed, but I want to make sure that I do it right. It's carefulness. Diligent speed. And then he said, yeah, what? Clearing of yourselves. That's the Greek word apologian, which has the idea of apologizing for wrong. Guess what? Sometimes you might go to someone and say, I apologize. And they say, well, I don't accept it. Then guess what? Then it's between them and God. You've done your part. Amen. There's no guarantee that people are going to have a desire to get right. But you can do your part. Clearing of yourselves. Clearing of yourselves. And then, yea, what? Indignation. Indignation has the idea of literal, uh, a determined hatred of sin. You know, part of our problem nowadays is we just like sin too much. We haven't developed a disdain for it. And by the way, Let's just go ahead and face facts. To our flesh, sin is fun. If it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Amen? But whenever we start looking at it like God looks at it, then we can have indignation. A hatred for sin. Yea, what? Fear! That means a caution against repeating wrong. You don't want to do the same thing again. Man. I've told the story before. I'm almost through, I promise. But I went out to go hunting at my granddaddy Van's place. And I always like to go out in the, in, the, in the pasture where the cows and the bulls were because metal larks were always out there. And by the way, metal larks would eat almost as good as quail, just not as big. And I'd go out there to kill metal larks so we could eat them. And so I went out there and he's standing there. And he knew exactly what was getting ready to happen. Uh, he, was a, he was a cantankerous old cuss sometimes. And I got down there and, and, and barbed wire going along. And I, I, I sort of had my leg up getting ready to go through the, the second strand of barbed wire. And grab the, the wire and push down on it so I could get through. And he didn't tell me that the electric fence was turned on. And I got right there in the middle and I'm holding that thing like this. I got one leg on one side, one leg on the other side. And he's standing there laughing saying, feel good, don't it, boy? And no, it didn't feel good. And so he reached down and picked up a stick and put it against my shoulder and pushed me through. You know what? From that point on, I always check to see if that fence was on before I grabbed a hold of it again. That's what we need to do. We don't want to repeat that same painful thing. That, that's fear. And zeal. That's a holy enthusiasm. Vimit desire. Fervency to make things right. And then revenge. Revenge doesn't mean getting even. But revenge here in this text means taking the proper actions. Do we really want God to be stirring in our lives? Are we just sort of content to sort of be like an old dead fish and go with the flow? Or we want to have enough power that we can swim upstream. That we can be vibrant. That we can be alive. That we can be used by God. Do we really want that? And we need to look inside and say, okay, number one, do I know Christ as my Savior? Is it real? Is my relationship real? And then, if it is real, has anything got me off track? And if anything's got me off track, what do I need to do to get back on track? 
And then, oh God, help me be serious about getting back on track. That needs to be our heart cry today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I appreciate your good attention. I fear a lot of times we talk a better brand of Christianity than we are actually committed to live. Do we really want the power of Christ on our lives? Do we really want to be a testimony to those who need Christ? Do we really want to hear Jesus say one of these days, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, at his judgment seat? Let's look within. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't say, Well, now so and so, if they'd get right, I'd get right. No, you've got to quit thinking that way. You just say, Lord, what about me? It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Speak to my heart and life today. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Move us now by your Holy Spirit. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.